I'm so glad you're here. You know, they say that in a 20 minute talk, you're supposed to give one idea, ask one question, and give one theme. This is not going to be like that. <laughs> because, you know, I'm, I know that I don't want to talk for much longer than that, but there has been so much going on in my heart and today that we might go over a little bit, who knows. But anyway, Chris, thank you for that beautiful prayer. For those of you who don't know, I've been, in inter, uh, I've been in an interfaith seminary for the past two years, and I'm going to be ordained on June 6th. So I promise I will still clean the bathrooms and wash the coffee pots. And maybe not in a much more spiritual way, but I appreciate that very much. You know, as I was getting ready for this talk, I looked at the calendar and I looked at my talk for last Memorial Day. And it struck me that on May 25th, last year, I gave the first talk after Reverend Stephanie left. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, she left on May 14th, and the next week was the first talk of our new adventure. And I talked about embarking on a new adventure. And I talked about gratitude. And I talked about not knowing. And how we are grateful even in the not knowing. And what I want to remark upon today as we start is that we are embarking on a new adventure. And let's think today how we want my talk to sound in a year. Because today we start to write the next year of our adventure, don't we? Look at all we've done. We were facing uncertain times. We were facing some difficulty. Look at how we've grown, at how we've changed, at how we've come together. Let's think now about what we want to say next year. Does that sound like a plan? As we continue to come together, as we continue to grow spiritually, collectively, and as a community because we are starting on a new, wonderful journey. And we don't know how it's going to look, but we know it's going to be wonderful. So today, today is Memorial Day. I love Memorial Day. For those who heard the comment, I am a veteran. I did not serve in wartime, but I did serve for six years and a little bit. It helped me go through law school, which was wonderful. But I have a special place in my heart for Memorial Day. Uh, which actually started out being Decoration Day, for those who don't know. It started out as a time when we would get together and decorate the graves. Of, it started the Civil War, Civil War and Union veterans, and then it gradually grew to honor veterans uh, who died in all wars, or people who died in all wars, in the service of our country. But as my topic today is living through adversity, living through challenges, living through suffering, and loving through those events, I can think of no greater example than people who serve in the military, who continue to serve with love and dedication and hope and extraordinary courage in the most challenging of circumstances. And I just wanted to acknowledge that at the beginning of our talk. These are, these are young people. These are people who put their lives on the line and give up their lives for us and for freedom. And at the end of the day, when they go over that hill, as I said last year, they don't go over that hill for politics or for the government. They go over that hill and lead that charge for each other, for love for each other. That is truly love in a time of extreme challenge and in a time of extreme difficulty. And we honor that today. So I've been wanting to talk for a while about suffering. And I'm glad you're all here. Because how many people show up for a talk about suffering? <laughs> it's like, I, I thought, yeah, I better not even put that on the marquee because I'll be talking to myself, or maybe Linda because she has to run the camera. <laughs> but um, I wanted to talk about it, not because it's such a, a peppy subject, or because uh, things are going badly, or because I think y'all are way too happy and I just need to fix it. <laughs> I want to talk about suffering because, as you can see from our caring and sharing that we do every week, it's a part of all of our lives. As we get older, it's a, it, it's a significant part of all of our lives. How do we deal with adversity? How do we deal with suffering? How do we continue to grow and love in the most difficult of times? One of the ways we do it, one of the ways we do it is what we just saw. We do it in community. We do it here through our time of caring and sharing and support. 
As Reverend Sidney said a while back, if one of us is in a very dark place, he or she can call a friend, somebody sitting in this room, to hold the high watch and to know that all will be well. I called on her to do that for me at times when I could not do it. I literally called her up and said, I need you to hold the high watch because right now I'm just too dark. And she has. And that's one thing we do for each other here in community. Now, as I thought about suffering and pain, use any word you want, I'm just going to use suffering. I know pain and suffering sounds like a lawyer thing. I can't get past it. I'll just try to I say pain and suffering and I start dividing by three. I don't know. <laughs> but um, in new thought, uh, we really do not hear a lot about suffering. We are such a relentlessly optimistic group. You know, if, if we have any negative thoughts, if we have any dark thoughts, we're supposed to instantly, like, banish them and start reading through our positive affirmations. Don't you find that? Now, I don't find that to be all that useful all the time, uh, an exercise, because what it teaches me is to be scared of my own mind. I mean, what we think is if we have negative thoughts, if we have dark thoughts, all of a sudden we're attracting those things into our universe. I don't know about you, but I don't have that much control over the way I think. If I decide I'm not going to think a dark thought or a negative thought, it's like thinking I'm not going to think about a red elephant. I mean, there's one right there. It's all I can think about. So I think it's a good practice so that we don't energize our lives with too much negative energy all the time. But telling ourselves that we are never going to have negative thoughts, it's, it's too much of a burden. I'm already having negative thoughts. I don't want to burden myself with thinking that my negative thoughts are inviting all this mayhem into my life. I don't. I have them. The challenge is what do I do when I have them? I find it much more useful to become aware, as we've talked about in the past, that I have a choice of the way I think. I can catastrophize the future. I can worry about the future. I can make stuff up and then worry about the stuff I've just made up. How many of us do that? That's one of my favorite indoor activities. <laughs> yeah, something has happened, so I'm going to make it way worse than it potentially can be. And then I'm going to worry about that. That's way fun. <laughs> or I have the option to see it in a different way. I have the option to say, I'm going to learn from this, I'm going to grow from this, I am going to take my thoughts and I'm going to physically rest them onto something that is more positive, because I can do that. I can choose to think however I want to think. And when negative thoughts come in, I can say, I just choose to see this in a different way. We all have that choice, and we all know that, because we practice that here every week. Now, if you manage to get past the age of 12, you are going to experience suffering in your life. You just are. And a great many of us experience it before that, profound suffering before the age of 12. It's just a part of life. I will go so far as to say it's a large part of life. And that's one of the reasons we're here, is to learn through it, to learn to deal with it, to grow through it. So what I'd like to do today, just for a second, or 20 minutes, is figure out how we grow through suffering, how we continue to love through pain and adversity, how we gain happiness. I tend to believe that we are here on this earth in order to be happy. We are here to be happy ourselves and to spread happiness to others. And remember the distinction I drew a couple weeks ago, it's not happy as in, oh, I just got a new iPhone. It's happiness, even though that is way cool, it is happiness in terms of deep abiding pleasure, deep abiding contentment inner joy that is not changed by what happens, good or bad, outside of us. That's what happiness is, as opposed to brief, pleasurable moments which we get from things we enjoy doing, going to movies, in my case, going to fries. It doesn't much matter. There's a distinction. So we are here on Earth to be happy. And the way we do it is by acting in accordance with our inner nature, by walking hand in hand with spirit, by showing love to others, by being compassion, by being love, by sharing it and shining our light out in this world. That is how we, we achieve happiness. Now, suffering comes along. Suffering deters us from that. It focuses us on negative thoughts. It focuses us on pain. The, His Holiness the Dalai Lama teaches that suffering diminishes happiness. And I think the way it does it is it just distracts us. It deters us from our mission which is to love, 
to serve, to share. So we have to learn how to diminish suffering because it will increase our happiness. This just makes sense. Now, there are those who will teach that we are here to suffer. Who's ever heard that? We are here to suffer. We are here, a life is short and you die. Remember that? Okay. We are ennobled by suffering. We are, uh, we achieve salvation through suffering. I don't believe any of that. We are here not to be miserable. We are not put on this earth to be miserable. Suffering is not a goal. It is a fact. That is why we're here when we were in spirit before. We did not suffer when we were in spirit afterwards. We did not suffer. It's part of our mission here on earth to learn to grow through it. But that's not why we were created. Our job here is to shine our light. We are beings of wonderful and magnificent light. And our job is to learn in all circumstances to shine it. We are here to love, to continue to be loved, even as we encounter events that cause us pain, that cause us to suffer. I believe that the only way we pass through suffering, grow and learn from it, is by continuing to reflect the love that is at our very essence. That is a choice we always have. And nothing and nobody, as, as Joan read in our reading, can take it away from us. We always have a choice to continue to believe that love is at our essence and that we have the option to show it. Some of you may be familiar with the life and the work of a guy named Dr. Victor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Is anybody familiar with that book? I love that book. I encourage you to buy it and read it. It's called, again, Man's Search for Meaning. I would think it would be 20 volumes with a title like that, but it's not. It's a very small book, and it talks about his experiences in the Nazi concentration camps. Viktor Frankl was born in Vienna in 1905. He was an Austrian neurologist and a psychiatrist who, along with his wife, was taken prisoner by the Nazis in 1942 and in October of 1944 was sent to Auschwitz and then to Dachau. His wife was sent to Bergen-Belsen where she died. Uh, for those who may remember, uh, Bergen-Belsen was also the camp where Anne Frank and her sister Margo died in early 1945. For those who have read Diary of Young Girl. Now, what he writes about in, in his book is his experiences, but it's also the revelations and the, the, the learning he achieved in the course of those experiences. I, I think it is such a rich and a wonderful teaching for us. Uh, what Dr. Frankel did when he got out, because he was liberated, obviously, is he created the Psychological School of Logotherapy, which is the school of psychology that teaches that man's ultimate happiness is found in finding a meaning for one's life. For those who are interested in psychology, it's the third school of psychology after Jung, Adler, the next is Victor Frankel. Why do I know these things? <laughs> okay, anyway, it's, it, it's an interesting course of... Uh, psychology. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Holocaust history, there can be absolutely no doubt that those imprisoned in the death camps suffered beyond the bounds of what anybody can be expected to endure. We've all read of the deprivation, the cruelty, the depravity, the fear that they endured every single day. And Dr. Frankel endured that as well. He was a slave laborer for a number of months. And the the accounts he gives of his life are, are just, they're just transformative. One day, as he was living through these terrible conditions, he had a profound and a life-altering realization that I want to share with you today. Early one morning, he and a group of other laborers were being marched from their camp to their work site. It was early morning, they had nothing to eat, it was freezing cold, they were not allowed to talk, they were being yelled at, they were being hit with rifle butts. And it was just misery. And they knew that this misery was going to continue all that day because they had to work outside. The man marching next to him whispered suddenly, if our wives could see us now, I hope they're better off in their camps and they don't know what is happening to us. So this man next to him mentioned his wife. Frankel said that that comment brought on thoughts of his own wife, who at that point was already dead, but he didn't know that because she had been transferred to Bergen Nelson. As he thought about her, as he focused his love on her, he saw her. He saw her smile. 
He heard her talk to him. He just felt her presence there acutely. And he wrote as follows. A thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief can impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. I understood how a man who has nothing left in this world may still know bliss, be it only for a brief moment, in the contemplation of his beloved. For the first time in my life, I was able to understand the meaning of the words, the angels are lost in perpetual contemplation of an of an infinite glory. What he realized in that moment, and I find it hard to put into words, is that we have the choice, each of us, deep in our soul, to realize that love remains, always. What he called this was the liberation of the spiritual life, and it carried him through the rest of his time. He went on to write that the liberation of the spiritual life available in the camps didn't occur only through thinking of your beloved, through thinking of a family member. He wrote that that same spiritual freedom is available in one's reaction to any set of circumstances, any set of depravity or deprivation or suffering or fear. He wrote of those in the camps who comforted others, who gave away their food, who gave away the last scraps of clothing they had, who always put others first. He said, they may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing. The last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. It is this spiritual freedom which cannot be taken away that tells us that each of our lives has meaning. Each of our moments of suffering has profound meaning. And that knowledge cannot be taken away, and it is never lost. He noticed that those in the camps who had given up, who had nothing to live for, who had no reason to keep going on, they're the ones who died, even though they may have physically been more robust than those who lived. He tells the story of one man who confided to him that he knew that the camp was going to be liberated on March 30th of 1945. He just knew that. As it got closer to March 30th, the man sickened because there was no indication the camps were going to be liberated. And he fell into a coma on March 30th and died on March 31st. That is the power of the human heart. That is the power of our ability to choose whether we will believe in love, whether we will believe in hope, or whether we will just go into the darkness. That is all our choice. What Frankel realized is the inner power, the absolute strength that comes through knowing that our lives have meaning, no matter what is happening to us. That each of us is here for a purpose, that love is still present. And what is astonishing is he found that after being stripped of all that he had, being stripped of his position, his job, his family, his friends, his future, when he was stripped down to the naked nothingness of just him, he realized that love remained. It was all that remained. It was the power that permeated everything and it never left. When all else is gone, love always remains. When all else is gone, the power and the presence of love, the enveloping power of love, remains with us. And it is our choice to always remember that. I have found in my own life that when things get so dark I just can't see out, that is when I make those realizations. I have never been, obviously, in any circumstance as horrible as that, and I believe that none of us here has been in any circumstance as horrible as that. But don't we know that when we are just looking into the abyss, that is when we see the light shining back at us, that when we become aware of the power and the love in our own hearts. That never leaves us. What a wonderful gift is that knowledge. And sometimes it takes those moments in order to realize it. 
when we are broken down by suffering, when we have nowhere to turn, and it seems like despair is the only option. If we look up, we look out, we continue to hope, that is when the light of love continues to shine. We continue to know that spirit or God or whatever you call it is still available. Frankel tells the story of when they were on troop trains, being, uh, trains being transferred from point A to point B, and the cars were so packed that people had to take turns sitting down. It was just excruciatingly horrible conditions. They had a tiny little window up there, and when they would pass a beautiful sight, they would call each other over and say, look, how beautiful is it there? I mean, imagine the strength of that heart. I mean, that's that strength that's in all our hearts. But sometimes it takes circumstances like that, or just even hearing about circumstances like that, to know that we can do it. To know that that love is always there. Now, it's possible at times like this, we may doubt, we may wonder if there is a God, we may wonder if there is a loving God. I have a very good friend who has always asked the question, why does evil prosper? Why is there suffering in the world? And I don't have an answer for that. It's probably one thing that drove me to seminary. I don't know. I'm going to do a talk on it. We're just going to explore it, but I don't know. And she said, it's not that there shouldn't be evil in the world. It's just, why isn't the playing field level? It's so easy to be evil. It's so hard to be good. <laughs> if anyone has an answer, please see me after the service. But I don't know the answer to that. But. We do know that it is within our power to continue to shine the light of love, even in difficult circumstances, even in circumstances of suffering and loss, even when we doubt. Sometimes, if we have very deep faith, that also leads us to have very deep doubts. When your heart has been opened so profoundly by the love of God, by the faith that fills it, that same space can be filled with doubt, and that's something that we all experience. Parker Palmer wrote, the deeper our faith, the more doubt we must endure. The deeper our hope, the more prone we are to despair. The deeper our love, the more pain its loss will bring. These are a few paradoxes we must hold as human beings. He goes on to say, if we refuse to hold them in hopes of living without doubt, despair, and pain, we also find ourselves living without faith, hope, and love. Don't you see that? If your heart is not open to great doubt, your heart is also not open to great love. If we just skim the top of life, if we never entertain those deeper questions, if we never cultivate our connection with spirit, if we never think about the sorts of things we are talking about here today, we may have no crisis of faith. But we will also miss the deeper love, the more profound joy, and the deeper connection with spirit that we get through entertaining these deeper questions, through leaving ourselves open to the suffering, to the despair, to the doubt. We will also deprive ourselves of the strength and support that spirit provides in times of difficulty. So if you have doubts, as we all do, they also can be moments where we are able to transform them into understanding of great faith. I believe that our choice of how we deal with pain or suffering in our lives is a very individual question. I thought about this a lot when getting ready for this talk. I don't have guidance, I don't have a checklist to give people how they deal with suffering and how they deal with pain. There are some general principles that we can discuss, which we have discussed, but I don't know. It's an individual thing for every individual person. Each of us needs to develop a response and a practice that works for us. And it's truly a matter of trial and error. I'm sure our responses and our practices change as we age. We find some that work and some that do not. I know when I was young and I was facing despair, I tried a whole lot of things that I don't try now. Thank God. I probably have a record. But I might have that third glass of wine. I might go shopping. I might do whatever. I find now that prayer, meditation, contemplation, talking to friends, that works a lot better 
because that addresses the actual issue. But a lot of us try to deflect. We try to deny. We try to deaden. And so what I invite you to do is just be aware of when we're doing that. The better path, the more loving path toward us and toward others is to examine these things, to face them, to try to walk through them. Because that way, we resolve them. If we avoid them, if we ignore them, they just keep coming back when we're leaving the store, when we've sobered up, when we've stopped watching television. The other thing that I have done as I develop my own practice is to take the view that all of life, that all of experience, all of my experience, is an opportunity to experience God. You know, we tend to think we just see God in the good things. All of it, all of it is God. All of it is holy. As Teilhard de Chardin wrote, the world is in truth a holy place. And isn't that what Viktor Frankl was teaching us? When he taught how one can find meaning and purpose and love in walking through all those dark spots. All of it is God. We find support, we find comfort in knowing that all of our experiences are infused with the presence of spirit. All of it, the good and the bad. All of life becomes an opportunity to love, to hope, to work for the good. That's our choice. Do I manage to succeed all the time? Of course I don't. That's why we call it practice. None of us succeed all the time. That's why we're here. We're practicing. I'm lucky because I have kids that help me practice. <laughs> and I'm sure you do too. I just have to tell you a funny story. I had a very tough morning a couple mornings ago. I think I told Linda this story. And I was driving along and something that happened. I was taking Nick to his, my son with Down syndrome. I was taking him to his day program. And something had happened that I was so mad. I was just driving along and I was cursing. I was just cursing out loud. I was so mad just driving along. And Nick is sitting in the back seat. And all of a sudden I feel this little hand on my shoulder. And he goes, Mom, bleed, bleed. <laughs> he's, telling me, he's telling me to breathe. He goes, just bleed. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when we take our kids here. You know? He's telling, Nick was telling me just to breathe. So I breathed and I felt better. So, one of the things we always say, and if we say it, we say it a lot, I've said it, is that we grow through suffering, we are transformed through suffering, we learn our life lessons because of it. And as I got ready for this talk, I thought, well, what does that mean? How do we grow through suffering? I mean, what, what do I want to say about that? Do I just want to say it again, or do I want to just, how? How do we grow through suffering? Um, we learn individual lessons, certainly, about survival, about perseverance, about grit, about hope. Those are certainly things we learn through suffering. But I think it's more than that. I think we grow through it and we transform through it because we learn so much in addition to the ability of our own hearts to continue to open. We learn about the beauty of small moments we never previously noticed. We learn about the understanding, compassion, and generosity of total strangers. It seems that when we are going through adverse times, the universe just conspires. The world opens up to show us that love is always there. People come up and talk to us. Friends call us. We are comforted. Things happen. Experiences happen to us that show us that hope and love persist. Those moments help us grow through suffering, just through learning that love continues to be available in our lives. In times of deep difficulty or challenge, the world just opens up to show us the possibilities of love, of hope, of joy. Our sight becomes more acute, and our hearts become more appreciative. As we shed down to what matters, our hearts just open up, our vision opens up, and we can see what matters. Our compassion grows to include ourselves and others. These are truly the group gifts that we learn as we go through adversity and through suffering. We only appreciate if we always remain open to the possibility that love is always there. That's a choice that we always have.